The circuit breaker content that is not suitable for kids like me. So hi, Diana. How are you? Should we do the intro? Um, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Welcome to Crime Crazy, the weekly true crime podcast with Aaron Plyme and Diana Seacon, where we prove that we know nothing about our legal system, but we're still crazy for a good true crime story. Also, um, damn it, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, also. <laughs> Everybody is sick, and so we have decided to do this one remote. Yes. So I'm looking at Diana, but on the computer screen. Okay, so how do these things start again? What do we... <laughs> we okay, so we fucked up the beginning, so that's taken care of. Okay, good, good. <laughs> uh, Diana, did you learn anything this week? I did. What'd you learn? Okay, Erin, I have a question for you. Oh, no. I'm ready. Have you ever poured one out for your homies? Um, no, I have not, but... Okay, so if you had to guess, how old do you think the the concept of pouring one out for your homies is? 90s? Dude. What? So this is what I learned. Uh-oh. Pouring one out? Yeah is one of the oldest recorded human ritualistic behaviors. You're kidding. No. <laughs> wow. So this ritual has been practiced for at least 5,000 years. 5,000 years. 5,000 years. So, so not the ancient 30 years. Egy- no, 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 no. The ancient Egyptians were known to pour one out, although they often used water because it's associated with rejuvenation and life giving. Right. Um, their general practice was to pour out a little bit of the drink, imbibe the rest, and then break the containers on the ground. Oh, wow. There is a document called the Papyrus of, I'm going to go with Ani, dating around the 13th century BC. Mm -hmm. And it says, pour libation for your father and mother who rest in the Valley of the Dead. Do not forget to do this even when you are away from home. For as you do for your parents, your children will do for you also. The ancient Greeks participated in the practice, and it's called out in the Iliad. The ancient Jews participated, and it's written about in Genesis. Huh, some of those things I feel like I should have known about. Genesis 35, 14. Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with God, even a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So now uh, in the popular culture, the practice is largely associated with rap, uh, especially Tupac, who referenced it in several of his songs, including Pour Out a Little Liquor, which seems to give it away there. (laughs) Um, And then when he was murdered, one of the first things people did was to pour liquor out on the street corner where he'd been shot. And apparently that still happens. Wow. So yeah, no, it's super old. Huh. Yeah, I would have associated it with like hip hop culture and um or um I don't maybe even like gang culture, not that I'm trying to associate the two. That sounds awful. Right. But, no, but, but like somebody, that's how I first yeah, became aware of it. Is murdered and that's how you honor them. Yep. Yeah, cuz I mean the first time I ever heard anything about it was you know, pouring one out for your dead homies. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Huh. Well, mine isn't going to sound that interesting anymore. <laughs> Sorry. That one, like, that delayed the hell out of me. That is, <laughs> that's really interesting. Now, if you could find an ancient text where they literally say, pour one out for your homies, then you would win. Mm. See, I think what first needs to happen is that the allusionist has to do an episode on the origin of the word homie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we could go back properly and uh, and figure out which, which homie we're dealing right, with. Right, right. I don't know. I feel like it would need to be actually just the word homies. But yeah, I think so. That wouldn't, that wouldn't happen, I don't think. All right. All right. So, Aaron. Uh-huh. 
What did you learn? I was really wondering if you were ever going to ask or if I was just going <laughs> to sit here awkwardly until the end of time. No. Um, okay. So I was like, I want to learn something about octopuses. And so I looked it up. What? I know, right? <laughs> like there's anything I don't know. Um, but it turns out I might owe an apology for being an insufferable know-it-all. Shout out to <gasps> Rolling. To everybody that I talked to. <laughs> because, oh! Yeah. Because I've been on... This, wait, wait just yeah. a minute. This is a huge admission. It's not a huge admission. I am frequently <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but to everybody that you've ever talked to? Well, no, this is just something that I say a lot. And I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit wrong. I'm not totally wrong. I'm just a little right, bit wrong. I am intrigued. Okay. So, you know how... Every time I try to talk about more than one octopus, I like stumble, right? And mm -hmm. the reason is because I want to call them octopods. And then my brain goes, if you say octopods, everybody's going to think you're making shit up or you don't know the plural of octopus. So you really should say octopi, but you don't want to say octopi because that one's boring and like it's way more interesting to say octopus. And so this is all happening in my head every single time. And then it just sounds <laughs> like I don't know the plural of octopus, but it turns out I don't know the plural of octopus because <laughs> oh, I've been getting it wrong. <laughs> so. so it's not octopods? Um, it's close. So octopuses which I think is the worst plural of octopus, um, is apparently like the most common, correct, and accepted form of the plural of octopus in the UK and the US. Ew. Right. Um, the word that I could be saying, which is technically correct, is octopodes, not octopods. Oh. Because the plural of the feet, which is what the the pod part is, is pods and not pods. And oh. um, then octopi, which is also widely, it's one of those words that is just widely accepted, but it's not right. Um, it's not right. right. And so it's it's hotly debated. So you, you might get corrected if you say octopi to a real grammar nerd um, because <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And so the reason is that octopus is um a greek word so all right, it's a little bit mm, it's a little confusing <laughs> so octopus originally comes from greek and so to pluralize it it would have been octopodes um but that's really sort of antiquated and weird and nobody ever uses it um octopi to pluralize the us by making it into an i is a latin ending and octopus mm -hmm. is not Latin, so technically that is not correct. However, um, it the way that it traveled through word history, I really don't know what I'm talking about, um, <laughs> is that it started out as a Greek word and then was translated into Latin, and then we got it from Latin, so octopi might be okay to say, but it is a seriously debated issue among people that care about that sort of shit. Um, so I guess I will just start saying octopuses and I'm now disappointed with the whole thing. I think you should go with octopode. Octopodes. Yeah. Cause octopuses is like, it sounds dirty. It sounds dirty. And it's also really hard to push all of those S's out of your yeah. mouth. It's a, it's a very hard word to say. Yeah. So... One of the articles that I read, because I've read multiple articles on this, <laughs> um, said that if it were a, a native Latin word, that we would call them octopes. This is getting to be a Uranus, Uranus yes. uh, debate. And then we would call plural <laughs> octopedes. Mm. And... But then they sound like juvenile octopi. Octopiasis. <laughs> <laughs> the point is... Octopuses is apparently right. Octopodes is also absolutely right, but sounds funny to people. And octopi is also probably just fine, unless you want to get really technical, and then you could have a debate. Well, but this is where I'm going to quote my sister, the linguist, who regularly bashes me for being a pedant. Um, mm -hmm. 
English is an evolving and changing language. And if a lot of people refer to a word in a different meaning mm -hmm. or whatever, then it becomes real. Yes. Much like the Velveteen Rabbit. Oh, okay. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so if enough people are referring to multiple octopus friends as octopi, mm -hmm. then yeah, that's a real word now. So that's what I learned. Yeah. I have, I have a different question. Do you have a story to tell me? I do, but if you have two, then you should probably go first. I can do that. I have two short ones. Mine happened in the same month of the same year. Wow. Even though I found them in two totally different sources and they are unrelated. It, it, it was just a ridiculous time. I think so. Well, <laughs> so also I went with the Christmas theme because mm. I am way into Christmas this year for some reason. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I'm, I think I may be overcompensating for being so very far from home. Um, Seems legit. Yeah. Or maybe so, you're compensating for, you know, your closest local friend being a total Grinch. Yeah, except <laughs> that, that was kind of everybody that I hung out with at home, too. So. Oh, all right. Well, I feel better about Apparently, that. Apparently, I'm the only one who likes Christmas like a normal person. Hey. I, I do understand the irony of that statement. <laughs> so um there are tons and tons of of holidays um this month and actually we're doing a really cool project at work around that and um but i celebrate christmas and really love wrapping buying and receiving presents and giving presents um and so i went with christmas <laughs> i like how it was wrapping buying and receiving it's just all one motion <laughs> Well, yeah, I forgot the. It should have been wrap, buying, wrapping, <laughs> gifting, and receiving. Yeah, um, would have made more sense. It would but have. But I spent a lot of today wrapping presents, and then I went and bought some presents, and then I wished that they were for me. <laughs> so, but Diana, I know something about you and Christmas. I know that your favorite thing to do this time of year is put on pants and go to the mall Ew. and shop for Christmas presents. Lo okay. uh, you like to wear like little Christmas tree and bell earrings and oh, bracelets fuck. and skip and sing jingle bells while you're going through the mall and see all the people and all the lights. I know that's how you feel. I need a shower. <laughs> <laughs> it's that good? <laughs> No, I need to like <laughs> wash it off. <laughs> well, I have a story about a couple of friends who I think kind of enjoyed shopping more than you do. That's um, impressive. Except for the paying part. Oh. So on December 17th, 2014... Taurus Scott, who was 30 years old, and Gerard Dupree, who was 27 years old, uh, went to Walmart to do some Christmas shopping together. And they, they were just friends. Um, apparently, at least one of them had a young female person he was buying presents for. Because they loaded their cart uh, with a Power Wheel Barbie car. Ooh. Um, a leapfrog tablet, so there must have been a really little one, and then a Barbie glam vacation house. And when I say loaded, I mean they couldn't see around it because that car <laughs> and that house were really big. Yeah, those cars are big. <laughs> yes, and they just picked it. It took two of them to pick it up, put it in the cart, and then they just they just pushed it up to the front. Um, but they had absolutely they they had fully intended to wrap, I assume, and give these as gifts. They did not, however, intend to pay for them. So when they got toward the exit, they had devised a really creative and kind of brilliant plan <laughs> to get out the doors with these giant, almost definitely like door alarmed boxes, which was that Gerard Dupree, I really want to say collapsed on the ground, but I've seen the video and he very cautiously, slowly, carefully, and awkwardly <laughs> lowered himself to the ground. 
And then once he's on the ground and a couple people are kind of like, what the fuck is he? He's blocking the way that the carts go. And he's just lying there on the, like we watched him lie down. Then he was like, oh shit. And he grabbed his chest like he was having a heart attack. (laughs) And unfortunately there was no sound in this video because I can only imagine his acting skills, like his vocal acting skills. Oh man. But he lay there for a long time pretending to have a heart attack. And, um, and it was really, uh, I, I mean, I hope that if he had looked more desperate and more believable that people would have been more concerned. But in fact, there was only one little old man who was like standing right in front of him when he lowered himself to the ground, <laughs> who seemed concerned at all. And like, kind of talk to him this other lady stood over him and waved her arms around a little bit but like not in a concerned fashion and the greeter just sat there and stared at him and did nothing (laughs) so he's lying on the ground clutching his chest scott meanwhile looks over at him looks at the cart takes the cart and just pushes it casually out the door then after a, a few more seconds of lying on the ground pretending that he's dying um dupree just got up and he was still like he remembered to continue clutching his chest he sort of waved at everybody oh no no it's false alarm i'm fine uh walked out joined scott in the parking lot got in the car and drove away (laughs) (laughs) one of the articles that i read about this i think the author had the best time writing the article and their very best line in the whole thing was and then they drove away they did not drive away in the barbie car (laughs) Oh, that's disappointing. I know, right? They had the car and everything. Maybe it wasn't charged. Well, that's um, a good point. Not even a little charge like, to start yet with? Well, Probably it's still not. in a box. I don't know if it requires any assembly. I don't know anything about Barbie cars. No, thankfully, nor do I. Um, so the thing that... So this whole plan was, was pretty well thought out and very amusing for me. Um, and, and it worked like he created enough distraction that nobody even attempted to stop Scott as he just walked out of the door with probably $500 worth of Barbie and leapfrog products. (laughs) Bless you. (laughs) Um, the thing they didn't take into account at all was the fact that Walmart, not dumb, has cameras. Yeah. Yeah, and so the video that has been pieced together and is now available online, and I'll link to it in the show notes, um, very clearly shows them entering the store, walking back to the Barbie section, requires two of them to lift the car into the cart. (laughs) Um, They walk around a little bit more. Dupree looks a little bit nervous, probably because he knows he's about to have to fake a heart attack and he's never acted in his life. Um, And also totally the the wrong age. Yes, that. although although he was a big dude, so, yeah. like, maybe believable. He wasn't, like, I don't know, he wasn't, like, this terribly obese awful, but he was just a really big dude in general. And, yeah, Scott, on the way out of the door, just looks right up at the camera and smiles and keeps <gasps> on going. <laughs> no. and, uh, so it didn't take very long for them to get caught and arrested. And I don't have any information about how much time they will serve, but, um, you know, quite quite a lot of Barbie gear there. So. Oh, my goodness. That is amazing. It was it was fantastic. It made my evening. <laughs> well, it made my evening until I read the next story that I'll tell you at the end of this episode. Ooh. <laughs> because then that one made my evening. <laughs> it's a pretty good night when it's made twice. Right? I, I prefer <laughs> nights like that. So, Diana, tell me a story. All right. So, I do not have a Christmas-themed story, but I do have a story that I am hoping will help all of our listeners... Feel better about their own families. Oh, I'm ready. All right. On January 9th of 1990, police officer Richard Lawrence was on patrol Mm -hmm. when he found a gray car stopped on a residential street. And inside that car, he found the bullet riddled body of Pompano Beach, Florida, drywall hanger Christopher Morris, who was 42. Oh, my God. That escalated really (laughs) quickly. There was a car, and in the car was a dead body pumped full of bullets. Pumped full of bullets. Christopher Morris was originally from Detroit, and he moved to Florida around 1989 after he was released from prison. 
Gotcha. Having served about a year and a half for drug and assault charges. Mm. His parents, Theron and Lila Morris. Layla? Theron. T-H-E-R-O-N. Yes, exactly. So Theron and Lila say that after release, he was battling a cocaine habit and they tried their best Mm. to help him. They let him move in with them. They fed him. They bought him a car. And eventually they found him another place to live. And at his new place, he had a roommate, his former prison buddy, Martin Rector. Yeah. So that is like rule number one when you get out of prison, especially if you're in there for drug related crimes, is that you do not have any contact with anyone else who has a drug problem except at meetings. Oh, but the other guy didn't have a drug problem. He was in there for assault. Oh, okay. Well, I think probably <laughs> criminals at all count. I feel like that, you know. Yeah. Well, Florida. Well, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher and Martin had served time at Martin Correctional Institution in Indian Town, Florida, which is a name. Um, also, did did he think, do you think, oh, Wow. Diana, I can't talk to you at all. It's bad. <laughs> I get it. His name was Martin and the facility was named Martin. Right. Yeah. Just for him. Just for him. Yeah. Totally. Just for him. Yeah. He's he's innocent, but he had to go because he had the right name. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while they were there, the two men cooked up their next scheme, which they put into place <laughs> after they got out and started living together. Mm-hmm. Um, Martin and the elder Morrises became close. Martin said he was treated well, and he called them mom and dad. Oh, that's sort of endearing. It is sort of endearing. What a jackass. Yeah. So Christopher Morris had recruited his prison buddy, Martin Rector, to help him kill his ex-wife, Sharon, and Sharon's 10-year-old daughter. Oh, my God. To collect on the $35,000 life insurance policy. Life insurance is some dangerous shit. Right. Right. Also, I feel like life insurance investigators are more invested than, like, police detectives, at least in the movies, every single time. (laughs) And so if you're going to kill somebody, you shouldn't involve them. You should make an effort to not involve them. (laughs) Uh, Yes. Uh, So apparently she had about $35,000 in life insurance. They told Christopher's parents about the plan, and they promised to split the money with Christopher's parents. Okay. (laughs) Martin Rector then attempted the murder. He showed up at Sharon's house, posed as a flower delivery person, but Sharon wouldn't let him in the house because he wasn't wearing a uniform. Yeah, good girl. Right. So then they discovered that Sharon's life insurance had lapsed. So there was no point (laughs) at all in killing her anyway. The Elder Morrises and Martin Rector talked about this latest turn of events and decided that their next best step was to kill Christopher (laughs) and collect the $70,000 life insurance policy they held on him. Okay, can I just point out that $70,000 is twice as much as $35,000 for half as much murder, and they probably just should have started there. (laughs) It's his parents. Well, they were happy to kill her, the ex-wife. They obviously are lacking a moral compass. Well, true. So not only and were... a 10-year-old. And a 10-year-old, yeah. Well, I suppose they didn't want to, you know, leave the 10-year-old without a mom? They didn't want to take care of her. Why would they have? She was a stepdaughter. Like, they had no oh. claim on her. True. Yeah, so in that case, they're just evil. Oh, yeah, no, they're just horrible human beings. So they were not only pissed off that the original insurance killing hadn't worked out, but they were also angry because Christopher had sold them bogus cocaine for a thousand bucks and they had intended to resell it, but it wasn't real. These are the parents that tried to help their poor son. Uh Uh-huh. That took him. And get him off the cocaine. Yeah. By buying it from him. (laughs) Right. And then being mad when it wasn't real. How did they know it wasn't real? We don't know. I mean, they should have taken it to that uh, Texas police department <laughs> and had it tested. It's a really long drive, though, from Florida. <laughs> well, yeah, but it was $1,000 worth of Coke. Like, Yeah, that's true. It seems worth it. So Theron and Lila invited Christopher and Martin over for dinner and backgammon on January 8th of 1990. At about 11 o'clock that night, Martin put a gun to Christopher's head and forced him to the floor. Christopher's father bound his wrists and ankles with duct tape. And he's going, Dad, what the fuck? What the fuck? 
Christopher was then forced into his own car, driven by his father, while his mother followed in another car. On the way to the secluded area where they were going to dump him, he managed to free his hands, so Martin shot him three times in the chest. Wow. Christopher then got out of the car and ran to a field near the entrance of a mobile home park where he collapsed under a tree begging for help. Oh my gosh. I mean, he's a horrible person, but still. Eh, he wasn't that horrible. He was going to kill his ex-wife and a 10-year-old well, for $35,000. I mean, it was 1990. That was a lot more money back then. It doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so he was not a great guy. No. But still. I, I know. Martin and Christopher's parents talked him into getting back into the car, saying that they would take him to a hospital. And instead, they drove him to Coconut Creek, which is apparently a town, where Martin shot him in the head twice. They then abandoned the car with Christopher in the back seat. Was he shot six times? Um, so Once at the house, it dep- twice or three times in the car, and then twice in the head. He wasn't shot in the house. They just held the gun to his head and tied him oh, up. Okay. And I oh okay. Depending on the source, he was shot anywhere from like five to seven times. Wow. It the, and again, I don't know how much of it was people just not paying attention to detail. I don't. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that seemed to be, this seemed to be what most sources were saying. So this is where shit gets weird. Oh, this is where shit gets weird. This is where shit gets weird. Christopher's body was found early the next morning in the abandoned car. Once he was identified, police went to his parents' house to notify them. (sighs) They noticed that Theron and Lila were awake and dressed at 540 in the morning. And they didn't ask any questions. When Theron met them outside, he didn't ask them if anything was wrong. He just brought them into the house. Rector was on the porch, fully clothed, and Lila was in the living room. Hmm. But acting weird isn't probable cause. No. And the detectives spent the next several weeks trying to figure out who killed Christopher Morris. (sighs) Then one of Christopher's associates told the police about a man named John Wood. John was a local drifter, an alcoholic Vietnam vet who frequently blacked out and suffered flashbacks. Christopher and Martin had made his acquaintance at a local bar the weekend before Christopher's death. In the time between the murder, so sometime after 11 o'clock, and when the body Mm -hmm. was found. Like six hours later. Right. Seven hours later. Yeah. Whatever. Martin Rector met up with John and fed him details of the murder that only the killers would know. And convinced him that he, John, was the murderer. Oh, my God. So so when the police came calling, he confessed. He told them everything he knew about this murder. Wow. That, wow. For people who were going to murder two humans for money that turned out to not exist and didn't check that first. Like, that right there was kind of brilliant word horrid oh no horrid, absolutely <laughs> inexcusably horrible but like also i feel like it took some talent to convince somebody they had i mean even i, I don't realize that he sounds like he i don't know that it took much to convince him that he had done it poor guy so the police arrested john wood but they they weren't really sure they had the right man Although he'd given them facts that only the killer or somebody else involved in the murder would know, some of what he had told them was inconsistent with the actual scene. They'd been suspicious of Martin Rector from the start, and they'd noticed that when they searched the Morris home after John confessed to the police, they'd found Christopher's double indemnity life insurance policy and a whole bunch of death certificates sitting on the dining room table. Uh, (laughs) Wow. So, Perrin's not brilliant. No. The next week, the police called on the Morrises again, and they confessed. According to the detective, they didn't cry. They weren't particularly demonstrative. The Morrises told the entire story. Who was involved? Who did what where? The only name they didn't mention was John Wood. When the detectives talked to John Wood again, he said that Martin Rector had told him the details of the killing about 2 a.m. the night of the murder, 
almost four hours before the detectives had notified the Morris family and Martin Rector that Christopher was dead. I, mm. I would have been so interested to hear that conversation. Yes. Like, I feel like this story would make such a great crime drama. It would. There were not nearly enough details <laughs> with, yeah. with what I wanted. It was, uh, well, and again, because it was the 90s. You'd have to know enough and be careful with that conversation because you have to tell somebody that somebody that you that you've murdered someone essentially in order right. to convince them. But they'd only known this guy for a few days, right? Right, like, and you—that's a I, lot. That's just a lot. Yeah, it's risky. Um, so police reported that it did take a long time to convince John Woods that he was not a murderer. Oh, he absolutely believed he'd done it. Oh my gosh. Did it indicate like why he thought, like what he thought his motive was or Mm -hmm. how he felt about it or? Nope. No, there's very, there's not a lot out there Hmm. on, on this. Martin Rector was convicted of first-degree murder, sentenced Good. to life in prison with no chance of parole for at least 25 years. Right. That was in 91, so it's 27 years ago, uh, but I wasn't able to find anything more on that. I mean, he's just hanging out in prison, learning how to knit. Probably. Which doesn't seem fair, but whatever. Because <laughs> knitting is great. <laughs> knitting is great. In February 1992, Theron and Lila Morris pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. Under the terms of the plea bargain, Theron was sentenced to 20 years in prison and Layla got 12. Mm -hmm. And the insurance money was never paid out. Good. Wow. Well, I have a question about that. Okay. Let's say that Tyler, my son, murders me for the insurance money. No. Let me take that back. Let's say that David murders me for my life insurance money. Mm -hmm. He obviously is not going to receive my life insurance money because he's totally going to get caught. Yep. But would my my kids would receive it, right? And like accidental death and everything. All right. So here's where your friend Diana, the former insurance agent, is going to give you a little bit of advice. Okay. Don't get murdered. So who gets your money is determined by who you put down on the beneficiary form. Right. And what a lot of people don't understand about that is that that is the legally binding document about who gets that money. It is not overridden by anything other than another beneficiary designation form. It's not overwritten by your will. It's not overwritten by anything you've told anybody. Nothing. It's that form. If that person is not able to collect your life insurance because they're no longer alive or some other reason, Mm -hmm. does it not go to anybody? Uh, it it will. They'll make a good faith effort to find out who it should go to. So there are a couple of things. Any beneficiary designation form should have at least a primary and a secondary beneficiary that you can indicate. So like okay. my my primaries are all set up for Jeff. If he dies right. before I do, then my secondary is Liam. Right. Insurance policies will have a clause that tells you how they will figure out if neither of those people are available, who it is paid to. Mm -hmm. Um, So that varies a little bit on the policy. But for example, um, let's say that Liam was my primary beneficiary. He's older. He's got kids. He dies before I do. And he's still my primary because I didn't update any of my paperwork. I'm fucking old. (laughs) <laughs> then okay. what would happen is that his share of my money would go to his children, gotcha. my grandchildren. Um, if I didn't have, if I died and my parents were gone and I was unmarried and had no children, everything would go to my parents automatically. Right. So, so there is a system of how that is set up. But I actually wanted to mention the beneficiary thing because I think that's really important. Um, And it was something that became very apparent to me when I worked at a major insurance company in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Because the way I worked in employee benefits and the way we figured out who was fucking who was when the executives died and one of the life insurance policies was to his secretary or to a female coworker with a young child. Right. And the widow always threw a fucking fit because she should have gotten that money. 
doesn't matter. Everything in the will would have been left to her. Like she would have thought that that life insurance is going to her and it's not, it's the form. Right. But if the people on your form kill you, there is a clause in life insurance policies that if they're responsible for your death, they can't collect. Right. But then wouldn't it go to, it would go to your secondary beneficiary. So what if he had put his parents as his primary and secondary You can't, like, put dad as primary and mom as secondary? Yeah. Then, it, so in that case, probably it would go unclaimed because neither of them are eligible to collect and he was their only child. And he didn't have any kids that we know of. And he, yeah, as far as we know, he had no children and the wife was an ex. So... In that case, could a distant cousin at some point come forward and make a claim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's what happened with, like, Prince. Hmm. Not so much cousins, but he had no children. Um, And he wasn't married at the time he died. And he had no will. And I'm assuming no group life insurance policy where an employer made him fill out a beneficiary designation. Right. (laughs) Um. So, yeah, now his, I think, half-siblings are fighting it out in court, but it could go to, like, cousins. Um, But, again, that, too, you know, if it got to the point with my life insurance where it would go to my cousins, which would be way the fuck down the line, they'd have to know. They'd have to make a claim. Like, the life insurance company isn't going to make – they're going to make a good faith effort. They're not going to make a stellar effort. effort. Right. To to find somebody, they figure if somebody really cares, they'll be hunted down and then they can prove it. Right. I guess I was just wondering if it was possible that a life insurance policy was written, kill someone for their life insurance and get it anyway, if the person who was the beneficiary was... Would have, you know, would have shared... I don't know. No, I think the clause would extend to... Anybody in that like tree of den- of beneficiaries, anybody who's responsible for the death cannot collect. And I think that right. if they are later found responsible for the death, they would have to refund. Right. Um. And the life insurance company can't get out of paying a claim because the motive was collecting life insurance if they're not paying or if they are paying to someone who was not involved. Right. Like, if David kills me, that doesn't mean my kids are ineligible to receive it. Right. It would make it a little bit more complicated because they wouldn't have a built-in trustee, but that's a whole different conversation. one of my kids is 20. Yeah, but I don't think they would let him hold it for the the other kids. Oh, yeah. But he would at least be able to... Yeah. I don't know. He's... He might be old enough to... um, I mean, he's not the one who would take custody of the little ones, but... Assuming I don't die like now, I feel like he might be old enough to take care of his siblings. Well, he, no, I feel like he might be legally old enough to take care of his siblings. Yeah, I think so. But Tyler, don't, don't do that, honey. Just Aunt Morgan will take care of everybody. Okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Right. It's, it's going to be good. Yeah. That was really fascinating. And now I want to watch this movie. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there is one, but there should be. You know that we have a friend who wants to come on our podcast who also writes screenplays. Ooh. This is a totally untapped market here. That's <laughs> true. That is true. We'd have to get more research. The uh, Literally the best source I found, I found a, I believe, fairly defunct true crime blog mm. that had collected all of the local newspaper stories about this case. Because when I just searched for it, I didn't find a ton until I found this blog and there it all was. That's cool. Yeah. So I mean, I feel more digging. Well, yeah, you dig as much as you could and then you would just fictionalize. Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly enough there. You could. Yeah. There's enough there to make a really good fictionalized story. Yeah. I was a little surprised they didn't spend more time on uh, wood. And kind of how that yeah. happened and like that would be a really... He's kind of a main character there. Right. Because there's Just so the many... Twist. There's so many interesting things there. One is, I mean, obviously you've got the ex-con, eh, whatever. 
Um, mm-hmm. Apparently, when he died, all of his his parents told everybody, like, man, eh, it was a drug deal gone wrong. Wow. Yeah. But so not only do you have parents that, from all accounts, were it's like they had no criminal record. Nobody right. like they seem to be just basic Florida retirees. Right. That Who happened to have a kid that was trouble, which is totally normal. Totally normal. And, you know, they kind of adopted, you know, troubled kids, troubled friend. Also yeah. pretty normal. But then to go from, you know, seemingly one of the police officers said, like, they're like everybody's grandparents. To go from that to be like, well, since we can't kill the ex-wife, let's just kill this one. Our child. Our, our child, only child. For whom we are paying life insurance on, which seemed weird in general, but whatever. Well, I don't know that that's not a good decision, though. If you have a really troubled child who is likely to die a violent or drug-related death, and you've been supporting them, and you're going to have to pay for their funeral, and you're going to have to, you know, pick up yeah, all but, the pieces. But you don't need $70,000 in oh, 1990 no, no, no. to do that. No, no, no. But um, I don't know. Maybe it's a good investment. That's a terrible thing to say. Well, no, but the other thing I was thinking, too, is like Jeff has a life insurance policy that his grandpa bought for all the grandkids where he put a chunk of money yeah. and it's it's grown um, oh, since yeah. he was a kid. Like the, the proceeds just pay the premiums and it keeps growing. So maybe it was one of those, too, where it started out where the grandparents threw in, you know, a few hundred bucks when he was born. and Right. And it became that. It also did not uh, give me the full information on what kind of life insurance policy it was, why the double cares. indemnity would have been called into account, because I, you know, I suppose murder is accidental, but that was in the commission of a felony, which is what they were telling people, like, that's a whole different thing. That would be no payout at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, not nearly enough details on any of the angles. Right. I, I feel like this is a whole episode of not nearly enough details, but like really great stories. Right. Totally. All Speaking right. of which, I have another one for you. Yay. Do tell. So we're going back to 2014. <laughs> we're going back to December. Right. Now it is December 30th. Ooh. I know. So the other thing I know about you is that you have 16 Christmas trees and the outside of your house is covered in a blanket of twinkling lights. You have a giant inflatable snow globe Mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. a snowman that Mm -hmm. plays music. Mm -hmm. And you have like 80 million plastic candy canes in your yard, sort of like flamingos, but for Christmas. (laughs) I really want that to be on a box of those at Target. Sort of like like Flamingos, but but for for Christmas. Christmas. (laughs) I should be in marketing, I'll tell you what. Totally. So, of course, that's not true. Diana's kind of like Scrooge, or kind of like the Grinch. Hey, 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 I found out that I have a wreath, and I put it on the front door. (laughs) I am just full of the fucking Christmas spirit. (laughs) I bought two wreaths. (laughs) I did. I'd forgotten. I bought this one last year and I totally forgot about it. And I put it in the box with the Christmas tree. So when I opened mm-hmm. the that to put up Christmas the Christmas tree, tree, I'm like, check this shit out. We have a wreath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more Christmassy than I thought. That's right. Okay. So anyway, so I am so full you are of, super Christmassy. I am full of the Christmas spirit. There is a wreath. There is a tree skirt. I am so excited. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, my family has already planned a nailed it style cupcake decorating competition. I have four matching red with white polka dots and lace aprons for all of the people who are going to be cooking to wear at my sister's house. Um, Wait, are these different aprons than the Thanksgiving aprons? Nope. I bought two more so that my mom and my <laughs> other sister can have four. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, we ordered embroidered, um, uh, like stockings with people's names embroidered on them. So they're embroidered pictures and then they have their names embroidered. So we all have embroidered stockings now. Um, I have nine of them in my living room. Oh my God. And that's not mine or my sister's because those have to come from Virginia. (laughs) Uh, I've been wrapping Christmas presents for weeks. (laughs) Like, I've got four Christmas trees up. Oh, my God. <laughs> but so um, these people in my story, now it's a man and his wife. Um, they're a little bit more like me than like you. <laughs> and yet there is a very important distinction between me and them. 
which is that they're going to jail and I'm not because <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. Um, yet. So. What? Yet. Yet. I did not steal that baby from the craft fair. So I'm good. But you wanted to. We all know. I it. did. I did want to. <laughs> it was a real well, cute baby. No, I, it was a really cute baby. And I did ask if you thought that they wanted it. They seemed very attached. I mean, they were literally attached. He had it tied to him. Yeah. It was a cute baby, though. It was a really cute baby. Um, okay. So let me tell you about Jeremy Llewellyn and his wife, Carrie Carly. Both of those names are really fun to say. They're very pleasing. Just, yeah. <laughs> I've only just this moment realized that because before I just wrote them. Jeremy Llewellyn and his wife, Carrie Carly. And I don't want to judge about age differences, but I did find it a little bit amusing um, and a little bit concerning. He was 18. His wife was 42. Oh, my. Yes. Um, and they just... I, I just couldn't figure out. She didn't seem to like him in the one interview that I watched. Oh, God. <laughs> and it just is weird. <laughs> so anyway, an 18. You Do you want to have anything to do with an 18-year-old? I mean. He can, like, no. bring you up at the grocery store. I mean, I was thinking, like, how do I say this delicately? It's I this is going to go really bad, isn't it? <laughs> it's gonna go real bad. There is one way in which I would like an eighteen year old, except I I am happily married and nineteen year olds didn't know what they were doing. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and you certainly wouldn't marry one, right? No. No. That's just I mean, no. So I think maybe it feels even weirder to me because I, I am not a 43 year old woman. I am only a 37 year old woman. Cause as we have established, you're way older than me. Way older. Um, I have a 20 year old son and I realize our age difference is not huge, you know, with his whole, like being adopted when he was 11 thing. But, right. but now 20 year olds and everybody younger than them are like my kid and younger. Like they're not, no, well, and <laughs> it's just, not right. And, <laughs> and what do you like? What do you have in common? Well, right with with a teenager Even emotionally. Yeah. Oh my god, no. Well, and I think that's the thing. It's not so much that they are what twenty four years difference. Yeah, that's not the thing. It's that he's so young. It's yeah, it's that he has only been legal for a second. Yeah. And he is not going to even start to be a human being for at least another twelve years. Right. No offense, chance. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, so I Yeah. Anyway, no. that is so not the point of the story. <laughs> no, but it is it was just something that caught me off guard because, you know, they always say the person's name and then their age. And right from the start, I was like, wait, what? Right. <laughs> no. Could we talk about that a little bit more? How did right. Um, also, I have already screwed up the details here because this is not the 30th of December. We have gone all the way back to the 19th. So oh, yeah. um, if you're keeping track, that is a mere two days after the <laughs> previous crime <laughs> took place. It was a busy week. Um, it was a busy week. So here's what happened. They lived on Angelina Circle North, which is in Colorado. And apparently they live in one of these neighborhoods that is hugely competitive when it comes to Christmas decorations. And all the neighbors have to outdo all the other neighbors. Okay. So all of those things that you don't actually have in your front yard, like they did. Oh, my God. Okay. Their home started to get more and more and more impressive every day. Like Ooh. just more decorations and more lights and just like tons of shit. <laughs> and at least according to the interview I watched with Carrie, she was a little surprised and confused by this. Although, hmm, was I don't know if I believe that. she not there? She claims that her husband was installing all of these decorations and that she didn't even know where they came from. That they just appeared and she was like, well, I don't think those are 
like things we bought and but I can't call the cops because they're in my yard and I might get in trouble. That That's her excuse. Gotcha. But then one of the neighbors noticed some of his gorgeous decorations had been stolen. And he happened to be driving past their house on his way to work or somewhere. And the decorations that had just gone up in Jeremy Llewellyn and Carrie Carley's yard looked an awful lot like his stolen decorations. Oh, man. So he called the police, who came and discovered that the couple had stolen over $2,000 worth of decorations from their neighbor's yards and then put them up in their own yard. Oh, my God. I feel a little bit like this is like stealing your neighbor's car and then parking it in front of your house. like. Or like the girl I knew in college who stole my favorite pair of earrings and then wore them to the next party at my apartment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't. Oh, my God. I mean, You've got to if... go to distant neighborhoods to steal shit exactly. if you're going to do that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, if you have so much Christmas spirit that you're going to steal shit out of other people's <laughs> yards in order to decorate your own, at oh. least drive across town. Right. Um, you're so already gets, saving the money. Don't be a total dick about it. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, flaunt it. Oh, um, God. So, it gets better. Oh, <laughs> I thought we were done. No. Oh, I'm so excited. Because, like I was saying, Carrie Carly tried to pin this all on her husband mm-hmm. and say that these things were showing up and she didn't know where they came from. She thought they were stolen, but she was afraid to call the cops because she was afraid that it would implicate her because they were in her yard. Sure. And so that's why she didn't call, which is total bullshit. She was in on it and they have arrested her and they're both going to jail. But during this interview where, and by the way, they're going to jail for felony theft charges. Wow. (laughs) Because it was over $2,000 worth of merchandise that they stole. Um, During this interview where she's pinning it all on her 18 year old husband, who she goes on and on about how, yeah, he doesn't seem to care. Like I told him it was wrong and he just doesn't, it doesn't even bother him. And like, yeah, because he's just an 18 year old. Well, right. But also just throwing him under the bus. (sighs) She also told reporters that in November, Jeremy Llewellyn, I just have to say his whole name because it's fun, um, had spent some time in jail. Okay. For stealing Halloween decorations. (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) That is amazing. How how do you not learn? That's not a hard lesson to learn. How do you not learn? Oh, my God. Well, because he's 18. (laughs) It's just so petty. Oh, my God. It's so petty. The point of putting up decorations is, like, to impress your neighbors. And also because it looks really pretty with the snow. But mostly to impress your neighbors. And so if you steal their shit and put it up, of course they're going to see it. Oh, my God. And of course you're going to get in trouble. And if that happens to you once... He it's must have done it weeks later, again. weeks after he got out of jail. Barely, barely. Do you think he waited until the day after Thanksgiving to start decorating? I would like or to hope think he, he at least the had he that home. much decency. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, if he was living in a neighborhood with reasonable human beings, they wouldn't have put their decorations out until True. the day after Thanksgiving. He wouldn't have had a source. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. My sister was telling me, I guess she's told me this before, but I forgot about it. Um, When she bought her house, it came with a pre-lit stag that they just left in her basement. And it's still there because she doesn't know what the fuck to do with it. I'm fairly certain that I left the new owners of my old house a pre-lit baby deer in the shed. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about going over and picking up that pre-lit stag and putting it in my not decorated yard. It's just like, here we are. And probably um, leaving know, it all winter. Get her permission so that you don't end up like Llewellyn. No, no, no. I, I don't even have a key to her house. <laughs> I don't think he had keys to his neighbor's house oh, I'm not... It's still in her basement. She's not putting it out. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, the whole bashing people who decorate before Thanksgiving, I definitely did this year. <sighs> but I'm going overboard with Christmas. And also, Thanksgiving is kind of a stupid holiday. 
I mean, I'm going to go ahead and agree with that one. Yeah. I'm, I'm done with Thanksgiving. I feel like that is fair for a myriad reasons. Yeah. So those are my Christmassy stories. Now everybody can be in the Christmas spirit. Yay! And Until the Until Christmas episode. There is a Christmas special coming out, guys. It's going to be so great. I am so excited. We're actually about to talk logistics because this is going to be a little bit of a challenging one yes. to record, um, even is. to prep for. And you guys are in for an amazingly special treat. Yay. With this special episode that we have for you next week, we're going to do a Christmas special. And then we are going to take our Christmas break after the Christmas special so that you get the awesome amazingness that we have planned for you as a Christmas present on Christmas Eve. Yay! And then we'll be back after the first of the year with regularly scheduled episodes. It is true. Um, I feel a little bit like I have been doing holiday-themed episodes a lot. Like we did Halloween. I did Thanksgiving. Didn't I do Thanksgiving? I think I did Thanksgiving. Yeah, I think so. And then I don't remember what has gone on. And then uh, I did Christmas. And now we're about to enter into the long, cold winter of no holidays. And I understand well below freezing temperatures. Um, I'm going to have to find a new theme. I'm going to have to come up with a really kick-ass St. Patrick's Day story. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I imagine there are some amazing St. Patrick's <laughs> Day crimes. <laughs> just seems like the kind of thing that goes together yes um okay so on that note we have our new segment that we are doing which is where we tell you about awesome podcasts we've been listening to because we issued you a challenge to leave reviews for our podcast and in exchange we will go out and leave reviews for other podcasts that we have never reviewed before and then we will tell you about how much we love them and how much you should listen to them so, Diana, what podcast have you been listening to? Do you want the truth? <laughs> Ours, The Dollop. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Uh, last mm -hmm. podcast, which does not need my support. Right. Although you could definitely tell people about it. Okay, I'm going to. So, as uh, we are continuing to leave reviews for, or at least I have been leaving reviews for my old favorites because I'm a bad audience and I don't ever do that. Uh, this week, I'm going to leave a review for, I can't believe I've never done this before, last podcast on the left. Uh, <laughs> I am a little surprised you haven't either because you're like kind of obsessed. I'm 100% obsessed. I just don't leave reviews. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I'm sure you've heard of it. They are a... They do paranormal shit, they do cults, they do uh, magic and serial killers and all sorts of cool stuff. They just did a series on, um, oh God, what the hell was it called? I gotta look it up. Oh, The Order of the Solar Temple. Which the Order was, of the Solar Temple. Order of the Solar Temple, which was a cult in the 90s that resulted in, I think it was 74 deaths. Oh my god! That nobody's ever heard of. And it was fascinating. Wow. Uh, they did a five-parter on Jonestown that I listen to when I'm feeling down. Yes, that is actually <laughs> the first time I ever heard you talk about last podcast. It was like, I was in a really bad mood and I needed to get out of a funk. And so I went and listened to Jonestown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a little fucked up that way. Rasputin, also good for a, a bummer mood. Uh, not because either of those are fun topics, but because they just, they cover them really well. So, well, and they're probably super distracting topics. They're very distracting topics, but I think the, especially with Rasputin, you know, before they get into like the, the real hairy end part, um, he was just a fucking weirdo. Right. Um, and did it with Jim Jones. Like there was just so yes. much, so much building up to, you know, the, the last real hard part. Right. The part um, that everybody knows, too. The part that everybody knows, but there, there's a whole lot more to it. So, yeah, they do a really great job. Um, I would say, you know, if you're interested in starting, Jonestown's a good starter. The first, you know, 100 episodes or so, or they're still finding their way. Um, right. But especially in the last year and a half or so, they've been doing really great, like, 
research and and delivery Mm -hmm. and really really good tying back to other things they've talked to um with order of the solar temple which was a three-parter that they just finished up uh, earlier this week um they are going to put together their notes and stuff and try to be like the definitive work because there's just not a lot out there about oh wow that's uh, really cool yeah um well or they think there's there's not a lot out there but what is out there is mostly in french because uh they were in switzerland and quebec gotcha um so that's really cool just it's been fun i've listened to them for years and years it's kind of what got me back into true crime as a grown-up and um it's been really fun to see this evolution and and how they still keep the really great dynamic but like their research is getting better and their storytelling is getting better and right um it's just it's a lot of fun and diana is dying for crime crazy to be part of their network so if you're from last podcast and you happen to be listening Uh, and you want to get diana a christmas present uh, that would be amazing um but yeah so go check them out they are not suitable for work and they are not suitable for like they're not everybody's cup of tea and, and no good for children. Oh, Lord, no. Um, <laughs> they need Sophia on giving a warning. <laughs> yes. but Her squeaky voice. They they are a great time. Um, they are probably, after our podcast, my, my very favorite podcast. I'm really glad that you put that little mm-hmm. clause in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I did another show that I would like it more than the last podcast, but you know, this one's pretty good. But this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just check in. I got to make sure you still love me. Oh, of course. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, so what have you been listening to? So I started a new podcast. Ooh. Well, new to me, not new by any means. Um, but Amanda's husband actually said, do you listen to this podcast? And I was like, no, I, I've heard of it. Like, I think he had probably told me about it. Actually, I've been meaning to, but I just, I'm a really bad podcast listener. And I either listen to everything and totally binge it or never listen at all and do other things. <laughs> so um, I tried it the other day because I was on the bus. I didn't have anything to do. And oh my God. I cannot stop. I've listened to like six hours of it in the past three days, I think. Oh, man. Um, and it's just amazing. It is called Binge Mode. <laughs> so um, they have they cover all different kinds of, um, of fiction, maybe all fantasy, actually. I, I haven't listened to any of their stuff outside of Harry Potter because, honestly, it's really the only fandom where my interest is being <laughs> so, but I know they did like Game of Thrones I think they must have done maybe Star Wars I'm not really sure what all they've done um, but it's sort of like each season I guess is another work and they go through the books the movies um, for Harry Potter there's all of the Pottermore canon they're all the mm-hmm. interviews with Rowling um, they're going through like they'll touch on all the Fantastic Beasts stuff um, they recorded before Crimes of Grindelwald came out so they are are making some predictions about what they think it will be about but of course now I've I've seen it so it's it's interesting mm-hmm. um, and what they do is they take about four or five chapters and go through them in such amazing detail that the episodes are over an hour long for four or five chapters and they cover everything. Um, They give you a brief summary of everything that happens in those chapters. Then they start to go through it chapter by chapter and just dissect everything. They talk about, you know, where, where this is foreshadowing, where this is character development, how it ties into, you know, the, cursed child play or the fantastic beasts movie that hasn't come out yet or this bit of canon that you know we don't learn until the seventh book or whatever um and then at the end of the episode once they've gone through everything they always come up with like seven facts or seven things that caught their attention or whatever and go through and like give you some really great like did you notice that Hagrid had the pink umbrella in this scene, blah, 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 blah. Um, And then they nominate a character from that section of the book that they want to honor that week. So um, the first one was Hagrid. And I was like, yes, he deserves it so much. (laughs) (laughs) I, 
I can't imagine. I just finished the Chamber of Secrets ones, um, and they are now doing the movie. So they did the book in in chunks, and now they're mm-hmm. doing the movie. Um, I can't imagine once the series starts to get dark and sad, and people we love start dying. With this podcast, I'm going to be weeping on the bus. <laughs> but it's amazing. It's a couple of staff members from Ringer, which is a website. And they have just amazing chemistry. They go all in doing voices and they're super, super knowledgeable, well-researched and passionate. And it's, it's great. I'm enjoying it so much. They did get one thing wrong. Hey guys, you got something wrong <gasps> about the mirror of Erised. And I was, I had to pause it and go out and be like, David, I can't talk to them, but they got it wrong. <laughs> Somebody was wrong on the internet. <laughs> they were wrong, and I have to tell you about it. But other than that, it's been really, really great. And I don't know how I'm going to listen to a different podcast for next week because there <laughs> are like 400 one. more hours of this podcast. <laughs> so what's that called again? Binge Mode and I'm listening to the Harry Potter season. So binge mode Harry Potter. And it is fantastic. If you like Harry Potter at all, I, really, if you've read it or seen it, you should at least listen to a couple of episodes just so you can be blown away by the depth that they go into. <laughs> can I can I put in a request? Yeah. Hey, guys. X-Files. Ooh. I don't know. I bet there are some great X-Files podcasts there. There are. Anything? Camille Nanjiani does one. Do you listen? Um, I I did listen when I was lis- or, uh, when I was watching the X Files the last time. I was doing it kind of in tandem, and then I just got distracted and stopped watching. Mm-hmm. But no, I loved it. He had um, he had a lot of people from the original. I should actually listen to it again and report back next week. But I think my very favorite was he had the I don't remember if it was all of the lone gunmen or if it was just Langley that he had on. But I met him. When I was in college, I, there's a picture of me and Dean Hagland. Um, I think he was a little scared of me. I was very excited. <laughs> Diana was a little overwhelming. Uh, well, I was, I was at a convention. I didn't expect I'd be meeting somebody from the X Files. <laughs> I was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> she was super excited. I was so excited. Uh, you can ask Dave about it when he's on because he was there. Oh, awesome. I definitely, definitely will. And I'll pull out the picture because I love it. Anyway, so yeah, that's what I did. I have already left them a review. Uh, I am totally fangirling. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Anyway, um, so we said all of that. Here's the thing that I know. I know that we have a review, but our little review catcher hasn't found it yet. I know we have a review because I'm, I'm fairly certain I know who left it, but... I don't know what it says or whether or not it's five stars. So that shout out is going to have to come later. All right. Um, If you've left us a review anywhere and we have not given you a shout out, feel free to let us know about it. Yeah. We've got a couple different review catchers, but they don't seem to be real time. No, I think one of them is like monthly. The other one is maybe weekly. And so there's a real chance that between our episodes, it hasn't caught you yet. Yes. Um, Also, if you leave them somewhere other than iTunes, there is also a real chance that we won't know. Yes. So let us know. Yeah, we are not intentionally leaving you out. It's just no. We want to to show you out. Yes, and we totally appreciate it. We sure do. Uh, But that being said, Diana, how can they connect with us? Well, first up, I want to tell you that Crime Crazy is sponsored by Elizabeth Wilder and Dave Hatt. Woohoo! Show sponsors support Crime Crazy on Patreon at the $10 per month level or above. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Yes, you are. A special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support Crime Crazy on Patreon, please go to patreon.com slash crime crazy or just search for Crime Crazy. All patrons get a monthly shout out on the show, plus some other fun bonuses. So do check out our levels. A hundred percent. They are so fun. Yes. We also give shout outs for reviews. If you'd like to receive a shout out, leave a review for us on iTunes or your podcast catcher of choice. If we have not given you a shout out, tell us about it. We don't get them all. We give shout outs. We love. Oh, yeah. Sorry. (laughs) We give shout outs for for all reviews. But we like the five-star ones the most. Yeah, we do. 
You can follow Crime Crazy on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash crimecrazypod. From there, catch up on the conversation by joining the Crime Crazy group, where you may or may not find some llama things from our friend Kimberly. Ooh. <laughs> uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Crime Crazy Pod, on Instagram at Crime Crazy Pod. Visit our website at crimecrazypodcast.com or email us at crimecrazypodcast at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter. You're at Erin Fine. I'm at Diana underscore Secon. And on Instagram, you're at E Pline. And I'm at Diana underscore Secon. And my Instagram is about to be full of adorable Christmas babies. Yay! You can't steal them. Well, you nope. know what? Last time, no, at Thanksgiving, when I was there, I said, I'm going to steal Sammy, who's my nephew, and I'm taking him back with me to Minnesota. And Josh said, I'll grab the diaper bag. And Morgan <laughs> said, we'll see you at Christmas. <laughs> so, and he's the good kid out of the three. He's like the angel. <laughs> um, so you never know. I might steal him. He is awfully cute. Oh my God. He's insanely squishy. He's, he is very squishy. Apparently, at some point, they discovered that they were making his formula twice as strong as it was intended to be made. <gasps> oh, no. And so he is super squishy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's adorable. He's got that smile. And he's always smiling, mm -hmm. even when he's sick. Morgan sent me a, a picture of him on Snapchat, and he's just grinning, and he has this fair, like, angelic hair and these bright blue eyes, and he looks like a little squishy Gerber baby in his mm. little stripy candy cane pajamas and um, she said something about how cute he was was at like really stark odds with how bad his farts smelled <laughs> <laughs> I saw something on Facebook I didn't read it I scrolled past it but the headline was something about uh, you know if you want your kids to to not be afraid of the monsters in the room, tell them that child farts are the best monster repellent and the kids fart all night. So it's just a constant. Oh, <laughs> I don't need to encourage my children to fart what? any more than they already do. That was my thought too. Liam's farts someday will kill us all. Yeah. For Sophia to get rid of the monster. So here's a parenting hack for everybody. I came home from a trip and... And on the door, there is a folded over sheet of notebook paper where my husband has scrawled reasonably legibly, no monsters, and then just <laughs> taped it to the door. <laughs> totally works. It is the only monster free zone in our house. Oh, man. That's all it takes. That, yeah, I don't think Liam had much with the monsters. He was deeply freaked out by the tooth fairy, though. So Tobin lost a tooth. I know. Oh. <sighs> Yeah, I'm real sorry. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it is fair to be freaked out by the tooth fairy. That fucker sneaks into your room, <laughs> gets in your bed, steals a body part from under your pillow, which presumably, I don't know, she's building castles out of or something. I mean, and then she leaves you like a little bit of money. And it's really weird. Well, the first time Liam lost a tooth was because of an accident. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so the the tooth fairy felt real bad about shit and may have brought a lot of stuff. <laughs> 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 but when when the the natural one came out, he was just appalled at that it had come out. Well, no, that the tooth fairy would come. He was just horrified. Um. So then he's like, "Well, how does the tooth fairy get in?" I'm like, "Fuck, I don't know." Like. They don't cover this. Like, <laughs> Santa comes down the chimney. Where does the tooth let, fairy come in? So we decided. Give me a second. <laughs> we decided that the tooth fairy probably came in the back door. So I wrote her a letter asking that she not come in and take Liam's teeth. And she has never bothered us again. <laughs> so so jealous of this. Yeah. No, I had to pin it on the back door so that she would, she knew not to come in. Oh my god, how did you wind up with a kid that didn't want the tooth fairy? This is not fair. Pure luck. Pure luck. Oh my god. So it was adorable. I got home from going out to happy hour with some of our coworkers yesterday. And David says, um, 
like after the, the kids had already been in bed, like we talked for a minute, we're standing in the kitchen. He goes, so tonight at dinner and he's going real slow and he's kind of like holding himself like he's ready to catch me. Should I like fall out in the floor? Um, Tobin, Tobin's tooth came out. I was like, oh, that's so gross. What happened? And he's like, he just was eating. And then he's like, oh, my tooth came out. And he said it was not, it was no big deal. <laughs> so did he freak out? Did it bleed? Did he cry? Like, so no, you were no the only deal. one freaked out about this. Yes. <laughs> yes, I was. And um, so, so David said, so I, I've taken care of it. He's like, I took the tooth. I put it right in a plastic bag. I was like, why? <laughs> he goes, and I've taken care of the tooth fairy. I was like, well, wait a second. How much did the tooth fairy leave? He said he left him a dollar. I was like, no, we've already discussed this. Tooth fairy leaves two bucks. So you're going to go back down there and put more money. Tobin wants the tooth fairy to leave a $2 bill, but oh. mommy didn't realize the tooth was that loose because she wasn't about to check. <laughs> and um, and so she was unprepared. Um, gotcha. So, so he had to go back down and do another dollar. Um, but I said, so where is the tooth? And he said... Well, that's what we have to talk about. <laughs> Do you want it for any reason? I was like, oh my God, no, throw it away. That's so gross. He's like, okay, well, it's in the garbage, but I just wanted to check. I was like, good. I never want to see it. I don't want it around. <laughs> and then I, I had this moment. I was like, wait, DNA. There's DNA in that tooth. If something happens to Tobin oh wait the hospital gave me dna i was like no we're good we have a little bit of his dna in the closet in the baby book <laughs> <laughs> i never but thought I about posted, that yeah it just, it just popped in i posted on facebook that this had happened and then in the comments i was like don't worry like i gagged so you all knew that was coming and the tooth is gone and like 15 people were like no you save them you put them in a box you put them in a, a blah, 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 blah. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Serial killers. So I have Liam's teeth. Serial killer. What is wrong with you? Because I feel so I don't want them. Although now that you mentioned DNA, we did. I don't think that was an option when he was born. Um, so that's maybe not a bad idea to keep one of them. But uh, I just feel weird about throwing away body parts. I feel like there should be a container or a drop off. <laughs> Uh, mm. All right, Diana, we got to wrap this up. All right. I'm wondering if you have any words of wisdom or good advice for us this week. I do. I think, you know, with the holiday season, we we tend to think about the, the people that are no longer with us and, you know, the other holidays that we've shared. And I want to encourage you this holiday season to, to go ahead and, and pour one on the ground for your homie. <laughs> But don't be the one that makes them a dead homie. True. And I feel like on the ground, outside. Outside. If you do thing. it on the rug, somebody's going to fuck you up. It's And then they're going to be pouring one out for you. Yeah. It's, it's bad all around. So outside. Outside. Yeah. Except maybe in Minnesota where I feel like it would just freeze on the way down. Then it's just a science experiment. Oh my God, it just occurred to me. <laughs> the frozen bubble thing is totally going to work here so much better than it worked at home. Uh-huh. I'm going to get some bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> See, winter isn't all bad. It's so pretty. That's the other reason I'm so into Christmas. Because here, it's like Christmas lights and snow. Yeah. That Although not, not very much. And it doesn't look like it's going to snow again much before Christmas. For a while. I know. Yeah. I saw that. Although that but, could change. Well, and the snow that we have is still there because it never got warm. <laughs> so so pour one out for your people. Don't be the one that makes them a dead homie. No. Call your people. Call your people. It's Christmas. It's some holiday. If nothing else, it is rampant consumerism time of year. <laughs> Just call and see if they want a gift card or a mug with Santa Claus on it. <laughs> exactly. Who doesn't? Or if they're alive. Right. Just check in. Just a yeah. little call. And don't end up on next week's episode. <laughs>